what is the hardest question on the exam? So I've seen literally every question that could be asked on this thing, and I've heard of every possible scenario uh, that they could ever ask. And the always the most commonly missed question, which tends to be the hardest question, deals with airspace and reading sectional charts. of Your Drone Questions Answered. Today we're answering the question, what is the hardest question on the Part 107 test? Today I'm being joined by David Young. He's the CEO and founder of Drone Launch Academy. David, thanks for hey. joining us. Hey, John. What's going on, man? Thanks for uh, having me on your show. My pleasure. So, David, I want to just answer, get, let's just get this out of the way first. What is the Part 107 test and why is this so important? Yeah, so Part 107 test, uh, it's what everybody calls it. Technically, it's not called that. I think it's called the Unmanned Aircraft General Exam. Uh, nobody calls it that. They call it the Part 107 test. It is uh, what you need to take and pass if you want to fly drones for any type of commercial purpose. So people think, oh, as long as I'm flying a really small drone, I don't have to have this Part 107 license. But actually, you have to have it no matter what drone you're flying. Um, so the Part 107 is more like your driver's license for the drone. The drone registration is kind of like your license plate or your car registration. So it's anything commercial use. And a lot of people think, oh, well, if I'm not getting directly paid for it, like cash or you know a check, then it's fine. Uh, but it also applies to things like if you're a real estate agent um, shooting you know, your properties, uh, or even if you are, you know, you work for a company, let's say you're an engineer and you go to fly the drone to survey some project you're doing, uh, that's technically for a commercial use. So you would have to have, it's called a remote pilot certificate. And you get that by passing what we're calling the, the part 107 exam. Let's get right into the question then. Um, what is the hardest question on the exam? We've been giving test prep for this part 107 exam since it came out in 2016. And we've had like 20,000 people take our prep course and we've taken the test ourselves a bunch of times. So I've seen literally every question that could be asked on this thing. And I've heard of every possible scenario uh, that they could ever ask. And the always the most commonly missed question, which tends to be the hardest question, deals with airspace and reading sectional charts. And if you're totally unfamiliar with sectional charts, uh, it looks like a map that might have been made 40 years ago that you can't even understand. And for some reason, the FAA wants you to know how to read those to fly a drone, even though in real life, you're just going to pull up an app and you're going to check the airspace in the app. But the hardest question comes when they combine several different concepts that you learn, they'll combine them at once. So one of them is, uh, are you allowed to fly in this specific area of the airspace before getting um, permission or prior authorization, let's say. So that's one factor. The next factor will be... Um, how high you can fly and what airspace that would put you in. So there's rules around how high you can fly your drone. So the rule is you can't fly more than 400 feet above ground level or above like a structure. So let's say there was a tower that was 500 feet high. You could fly up to 900 feet above the ground as long as you're directly over that tower. So they're going to give you, they're going to incorporate that in there. Um, and then they're going to um, maybe incorporate another tricky thing, which is reading mean sea level altitude versus above ground level altitude in feet and might make you convert some stuff in your head. We have a PDF that we came up with a long time ago. Still very applicable. The same question still on the test. It's called how to ace the hardest drone or how to, how to ace the hardest question on the FAA commercial drone exam or the part 107 exam. So um, we can link that in the show notes or the YouTube video or whatever you're watching this on. We're going to, we're going to give a sample question here, which is, uh, we're looking at the Corpus Christi airport. And what you're going to see around that is you're going to see some magenta, like purple looking rings. And so the color is going to indicate what kind of airspace you're in. So purple, like solid purple line is going to be class C, class Charlie. Um, and so that you would know that's controlled airspace, just in case you want to use this little study thing, that's controlled airspace. And you would have to get prior permission from the FAA before you fly uh, in that airspace. And so it's going to say, pretend that you're you're flying at the highest that you can fly above a specific tower that's around this kind of Corpus Christi International Airport. What airspace would you be flying in? And would you need prior authorization to be there? So that's the question. These uh, towers, you, you might not know what they look like, but there's like a legend that the FAA will give you, like in your handouts at the very beginning. You're, you're going to definitely want to look at this legend. It's going to tell you what all these bars mean, what all the little symbols mean. Uh, but you're going to need to be familiar with it before you go in there because 
if you're wasting your time trying to look through this giant legend of what everything is, you're going to, you're going to run out of time. From what I'm looking at, the towers are 1,104 feet, uh, mean sea level, and they are 1,054 feet above ground level. And the way the FAA tries to trick you up on this is just pretend you're on a hill, right? Then the hill is you're by the ocean. Let's go by the ocean. So that we're at zero feet sea level and you walk up a hill that's 50 feet high, right next to the ocean. So now you are at 50 feet of sea level, mean sea level. They'll call that MSL, but you're at zero feet above ground level because you're standing on the ground, right? But if you flew your drone up 50 feet, your drone would now be 50 feet above ground level, but it would be 100 feet uh, above sea level, mean sea level, because you'd have your lead, the ground starts off 50 feet higher. So that's where it gets a little tricky. So these towers are saying the MSL altitude, which is what airplanes use because they can't always know how the ground is moving you know, below them every moment. Uh, so they use mean sea level when they're navigating. That's why these charts are mean sea level. But it also shows you the above ground level altitude, which is relevant for drone pilots. So we know if the tower says 1,100 feet uh, mean sea level, but it says 1,050 feet above ground level, we know that there's about a 50 foot difference there. That's kind of like our elevation of this, this area, if that makes sense. And again, if you're confused by that, just type in MSL versus AGL. Uh, and we have a YouTube video that explains this more easily, and you can you can look at that there. But you kind of need to remember that for the answer questions. So we know, all right, the tower is one thousand one hundred and we'll just call it one thousand one hundred feet above uh, above ground level. We know we can fly four hundred feet above that, so that's going to put us fifteen hundred feet mean sea level and about fourteen fifty above ground level. Right um, now, the next part is okay. Now we know how high we're going to be. Let's look to see what airspace that's in. And uh, when you're looking at airspaces in these charts, there's going to be a thing that looks like a fraction. And the one I'm looking at here says 40, and it looks like a little divided by line, and it says 15 on the bottom. And what that means is it means the top of that airspace and the bottom of that airspace. Uh, and it does it in thousands of feet. So you're just going to add two zeros in your brain to those. So if it says 40, you know that's 4,000. 15 means 1,500. So we know that class C airspace... You know, if you're looking at this, you can see it's within this little purple area, starts at 1,500 feet, and those are always reported in mean sea level. And again, I know it sounds like a lot because this is probably the hardest question you're going to get. Mm -hmm. So if you can master this, you're, you're doing good. So you got to think, all right, the airspace starts at 1,500 feet, mean sea level. Um, so I'm thinking, all right, mean sea level. So now I got to think about what is my altitude and mean sea level uh, above that tower? And we had 1,104 feet was the tower height. Then we added 400 because that's the max we can fly. That's going to put us at 1,504 feet mean sea level. So we're four feet into class C airspace, class Charlie airspace. And then you need to know the rule. Do I have to have uh, prior permission to fly there or not? And if you study, you'll know, yes, you do because that's controlled airspace. So what you'd have to do in the real world is you'd have to go on any app you can go on um, Air Map. You can go on what used to be Kitty Hawk. Now it's called Aloft. There's a bunch of them. And you go on there and you say, I want to fly my drone right here. And here's the time I want to fly it. And here's how high I want to fly it. Request authorization. And a lot of times it'll give it to you instantly. Um, but if it's going to be like a special use case where you're actually flying pretty high here, you might have to get them to approve that. And you tell them, hey, I'm flying above this tower or whatever. And then they would approve that and then you're good to go. So that's in the real life. But the answer to the question is, Yes, you A, you would need prior authorization. And the reason is, is because you are in class C airspace. Um, so they're going to give you a couple different answer choices. They're probably going to give it to you. You're flying 1,400 feet um, mean sea level. So that puts you in chart class Charlie Air. They might give you the wrong altitude. And so that's going to make that, quite, that answer choice wrong. Or they're going to mix up the mean sea level thing. Or they're going to try to maybe say it's class uh D airspace and not class C. So you just, you need to be careful about how they try to trick you up, but that's going to be the main thing that's going to get people is how high am I flying? What is that in sea level? And what is that in above ground level? And then where does that put me in the airspace? And am I allowed to be there at that time? Um, and knowing how to read those charts and maps to understand that. For another question, it was like, Hey, you're going to inspect this railroad, right? And let's assume you're flying at this altitude. Um, and you're going to expect this entire railroad track from point A to point B. Anywhere along that route, are you going to need to ask for permission to be in that airspace? That's the kind of stuff that trips people up. And that is how you answer the hardest question on the uh, the drone exam. So the answer is, yes, you would need prior authorization. Prior authorization. 
and you're going to be in class C airspace at 1,504 feet above uh, or mean sea level. On the test, is this a multiple choice question? Is this a question that you kind of have to show some work on? Good question. No, you don't have to show any work. It says just multiple choice. And there's only three answer choices, not four, only three, A, B, or C. There's 60 oh. questions total on the test. Typically, I see sectional charts make up at least 40% of the exam, 30 to 40%. I gave you the hardest question on there, right? So if you're hearing this going like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Like there's other questions on there. Like if you crash your drone and the battery is bulging, what should you do? Shove it back in the drone and try to keep flying, uh, you know, safely dispose of the battery or, you know, go punch your sister. It's like, yeah. you're like it really simple. Some of them are just like so obvious. And some of the other ones that are tricky are like the weather questions. Um, they'll ask you how to interpret a METAR report, which you'll never have to do in your life again. If you're prioritizing an order of importance, I would go sectional charts. Um, I'd probably go regulation next, and then I would go weather. And then the rest of the stuff's important, but if you nail those first three, I would, I would have a hard time uh, imagining that you'd fail. Do you mention that kind of in the real world, a pilot would be able to kind of put this into his phone or computer and get a lot of this stuff kind of more instantly than doing the sort of calculations that you'd sort of run through? Yeah. I mean, this, these apps are going to do all stuff. You're going to say, hey, I want to fly here. And this is the altitude I want to fly. At, and the app is just going to tell you, oh, hey, cool. You need to reach out to the FAA. Do you want to do that? And you just like tap a button. Yes. You know, so yeah. it's a lot easier in real life. But the FAA for the exam, they want you to know how to read all this stuff and understand it. Is there anything that someone can do um, to help prepare? So uh, there are free things you can do, like Look at this PDF. This will help you a lot. This has got a lot of really good information. Um, there are like other, like some free resources out there. I know there's some like YouTube videos. We have some YouTube videos. So if you're hell bent on going the free route, like that's, I get that, you know. We have a paid study course um, that we've put a lot of time into. You know, I think we've, we have over 20,000 people that have taken it and passed. And it's like over 99% pass rate, whatever. The people that sign up for our course, though, really, if you're like wondering, well, why would anybody sign up for a course? We, um, it's pretty quick. So it's like two to three hours worth of video content. Um, there's a bunch of practice questions and explains why you got them wrong if you did get them wrong. And then there is a, a test simulator. So a t fresh batch of questions that you've never seen before. It simulates the same thing with the amount of time you have on the test, the number of questions it pulls. So it allows you to really practice um, that exam. And uh, we give people a plan to get through the whole study process in seven days or less. So Typically, people will buy our study course and they're like, hey, listen, I just want to get through this and know for sure that I'm not going to fail and not waste my time. Because we'll just tell you exactly what you need to know. We'll prep you for the test. If you complete our course uh, and you pass our final exam, uh, but then you fail your FAA exam, we give you a refund on the course and we'll pay your testing center fees back to you. So it's like zero risk for you. So that's typically why people want to take it if they're just like, I don't want to waste my time. Well, really good to know, and this is a really good heads up. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? It's a great time to be in the drone industry, honestly. If you're doing this to have a drone service business, I would say, um, you know, it's just like starting any business, right, where you got to be committed to it, and you got to be okay with people telling you no or not understanding what you're doing or whatever it is, right? Got to have some grit. But I would say if you're starting a drone service business, the most important thing you could do is find a niche and learn about that niche, all the non-drone stuff, right? Because, you know, drones are getting easier and easier to fly, so the real value you're going to bring there's all the other stuff you can understand about whatever niche you're in. So if you're doing real estate, understand how to do video editing and marketing and all that good stuff to help that client. Like the drone thing is nice and it's a good kind of uh, tool, but the tool is not what's going to sell you. It's the extra stuff you know. Or if you're going to work for construction companies, gosh, get in there and learn how construction works and what they look for and the problems they encounter. Like you want to figure out how to be a problem solver, not just like, hey, I'm a guy with a drone because that's not going to get you very far. And then, uh, and then secondly, I was going to say, if you're not a drone service business, but you work in engineering, you work in city government, you work in utilities, like so many industries, like you got to be using a drone. It just makes your life so much easier. Uh, engineering, real estate, oil and gas, um, surveying, um, media production. I'm probably missing a ton. Just take some time to learn about drones. Take this test. It's going to put your firm uh, in another place where other people aren't. Um, so I just think don't miss the train. Excellent. Well, thank you, David. Really appreciate it. It's uh, there you have it. The hardest question on the part 107 exam. Remember you can submit your own drone questions at ydqa.io. We'll get them answered for you. In the meantime, we'll see you in the sky.